Okay, every hi everybody. Um, the waiting room is uh, filling up, uh, so we are just going to give it a couple more minutes. Thank you for joining me today. A uh, couple more minutes, and then we'll get started very shortly. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, since we are uh, just giving it a couple minutes, uh, you will need a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil. Uh, so if you have that, um, please get that. Okay, everybody, uh, I think that we can uh, begin. Um, so again, thank you very much for joining me today. Um, I want to express my sincere thanks and appreciation uh, towards all of you for giving me just an hour of your time uh, this afternoon. And uh, you know, I very much do appreciate it. Now I wanna put a disclaimer on this uh, presentation, this talk, this webinar, uh, for all of you to so that it's all clear that you know I by no means am a doctor or hold a PhD in uh, running running the lives of teenagers uh, but you know I do have a lot of experience with teenagers and you know what I think it's very important that you know that I do not have all the answers I have a lot of experience with teenagers um, and dealing with teenagers. And I'll, I'll go more into that as we get along with the presentation. So the way it's gonna work today is that, uh, again, you need a uh, piece of paper uh, to write some of your answers down. Um, and I, I think that it's uh, important that you do try, all right? Um, and you know, get, get into the feeling of what we're gonna be doing here. Uh, so I'm going to begin. Now, I'm going to start sharing my screen. So if you do have questions, you can put them into the chat box. But I can't see the chat box while I'm sharing screen. So don't be upset or sad that I haven't got to your question as we're going through the presentation. Uh, once I stop sharing screen, I will get to your questions in the chat box. Otherwise, um, I will let you know that my presentation that I have set up, it should only run for about 30 minutes because I figured that we would have a longer question and answer period towards the end of the session. Uh, since I doubt I will be able to cover all the diverse needs uh, in this room today. Uh, there is a lot that can span from uh, teenagers. Some of you are here who don't have teenagers yet. And some of you have children that are 13 uh, all the way up to 19 years old. Uh, so if you can imagine what it was like when you were 13 years old and how different it was when you were 19, uh, the world is a very different place. Uh, and you were a very different person from when you were 13 and 19. So the uh, diverse requests 
uh, will, and specific questions that you may have probably come towards the end of the session in the Q&A session. So I'm just gonna uh, let you know that I will be sharing screen now. So again, if you have any questions, feel free to put them into the chat box, uh, but I can't get to them while I am sharing screen, all right? So uh, let us begin. Okay, so before you get, we get started here, let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Michael, Mr. Michael Singh, head teacher here at CIS Kalapagate. Uh, now, I grew up in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, uh, and I was there for, since I was born, 23 years, and I moved here um, after that, after the age of 23. Now, um, you know, what makes me an expert? Um, now, I, that's a good question. What makes me an expert? I am not a very old, old person, and I don't have any teenagers in my life. I am not the parent of a teenager at the moment. Uh, but you know what? You have teenagers in your life, or you may have some. Uh, but you know what? I've dealt with teenagers for the past 15 years, and I've dealt with thousands of teenagers. I've dealt with thousands of teenagers from various countries and backgrounds. Um, you know, I started dealing with teenagers when I started being a basketball coach, uh, and uh, that was in a neighborhood that was full of a lot of immigrants and refugees and kids from what we call single household households, uh, where there would be only one parent, either the parents were separated, divorced, or not living together. So I've seen children. Uh, teenagers specifically from all different races, all different socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, and I have a wealth of experience in dealing with this kind of situation. Um, so I, again, do not hold a doctrine in uh, dealing with teenagers, but I've seen teenagers from all over the world and many, many years and many different kinds of teenagers. Uh, so, you know, the toughest thing is dealing with your own child. Uh, and you know, regardless of what profession you are in, you'll, it's easy to see the way that when you go home and you speak to your child, uh, it's very different. And you know, I could probably speak to your child, elicit certain information out of them. And you know, that's part of, part of what I wanna talk about today. And um, I'm wanting to you know, make sure that we're all on the same page here. I may not have the answers for you, uh, I'm not going to come back to you today with a three-point plan or a five-point plan as to, you know, here's what you need to do. There is no golden key for this. If there was and I had that, I would be a billionaire because uh, people who have parents who have uh, children that are of teenage age, uh, you know, would love the answers. But that's why you can research. You can do a lot of work in terms of checking out uh, different websites and watching videos. And people will give you lots of strategies. Uh, so what I want to do today is, you know, also uh, be a little bit more on that next level. If you've ever seen or visited a webinar or uh, seen a, a, a motivational speaker, and uh, motivational speakers will give you a lot of broad general ideas, of, you know, like, okay, you got to set a goal. And to reach that goal, you got to have objectives and overcome those objectives. I want to give you some real black and white ideas that you can use. So you can't come into this thinking that you know everything. And you can't come into this saying, or being skeptical. You gotta come into this afternoon open. And you know, not everything I'm gonna show you is gonna work for you. And nor do I recommend you using every single strategy because every family is different, every kid is different. Within your own house, if you have more than one child, you know each child is different, all right? So every approach is gonna be different. And some things that work for one kid in one family are not gonna work for another kid in another family. Uh, so I hope your kids are not around you, the people, the teenagers, your children, that you want to start opening communication with. Uh, and I, and you know, what I, I, I talked about aligning our expectations. Please don't come into this thinking that I'm going to give you the answer key. I don't have the answer. All right, I, I think we all have to be on the same page with that. I have ideas, use my ideas, use some suggestions. Um, and when I say remove your hats, all right, you have to remove your hats, your hats of, of religion, 
your hats of your profession, your hats of any sort of preconceived notion that you have. All of those hats, so to speak, whatever you do in life, however you were raised, you know, however your parents raised you at that time, they all have to be gone. All right. We're thinking about this. What we have in common is we are parents. Uh, we have children. And so we're all on the same page. So we're not bringing our other hats into this conversation at this moment. Okay. And I need you to listen and listen, listen, listen. And uh, in, in towards the end, happy to answer questions, but you know, listening is going to be a key theme throughout today. So I want to start with a very simple question. What is the job of a parent? What is the job of a parent? Uh, now, if we start off and I give you a prompt, my job is to make sure what? What is your job? Now, some of you, uh, like if you, if you are writing this down, if you're thinking about it, my job is to make sure my child uh, gets the best education. My, my job is to make sure my child has food. My job is to make sure my child has clothes. My, child, my job is to make sure my child has a better life than I did. That, right? Is there a right answer? Well, I'll tell you there's one overriding principle that sets this question and these answers apart from anything else. So give you some time to think about it while I've been talking. You know, what is your job as a parent? And your job as a parent is to do a number of different things. Of course, of course it is. Uh, but you know what? I'm sure, I'm sure. Whatever you, however you finish that sentence, all right, you are off, all right? Because your job is to love them, love your kid. Okay, that's your job. Now I have a caveat at the bottom there, all right? Now this is when you've got to start asking yourself these deep questions my job is to love them even if okay even if even if what even if they fail out of school we used to love them even if they marry somebody or fall in love with somebody of a, of a different religion you still love them even if they commit a crime and they go to jail, will you still love them? All right. Now, those are the deep questions that you have to ask, but your job remains the same to love them. All right. This is something that is an overriding principle in a lot of these relationships and strategies. Now, you are here because you want a, a couple of ideas as how to get closer to your children. And again, it is different for each age group. A 13-year-old is going to be different than a 19-year-old. The needs and the wants, the thoughts, the opinions, and uh, the ideas that a 13-year-old has versus an 18-year-old are very different. You know, and you can always go back. Now, you have your own self as the first point of reference. Uh, but, you know, what are your kids interested in? What do they like? Do you know? Uh, so I want to see where you sit. I'm going to ask you. I want to see where you're at. What do you know? about what's going on in 2020. You were not a teenager in 2020. You are not a teenager right now, right? Your kids are teenagers today. So what do you know about today? All right, now we'll get to that. So you have to uh, try and come up in your head or write down what your problems are. Is it communication? Do you want to speak more, more openly with your kid? Do you want them to come to you and speak more. Do you have conflict with them? You try and talk to them, they, they shut the door. They shut themselves down. Uh, they shut down. They don't want to talk to you. Are there social or emotional issues? Every time you talk to them, they react in a certain way. They get angry. Uh, are you worried about your child, in, especially now, in this, state of, in this state of online learning where the socialization between your child and their friends has decreased, right? Now we socialize using our phones, our thumbs. Is that count? Are you worried about that? Um, you know, these, these emotional issues, the impact that this will have on your children. None of us when we were teenagers, all right, had to worry about this stuff. 
Um, you know, I don't know who may be the youngest person in this room, uh, but you know, I figured if my math is right, that the youngest person in this room, uh, if you have a teenager, that is, uh, it would probably be, be between the ages of 30 to 35. If you were married at a younger age of 19 or 20. Now, if you're older than that, um, you probably didn't have a lot of uh, cell phones while you were in high school. Uh, so the world is very different. And, uh, you know, are there physical issues? Are there physical issues? Adults are also worried about physical issues. Uh, how do I look? Uh, am I, is my, do I have acne, pimples? Uh, you know, how is my, what about my body? Now, these are things that all teenagers are going to be worried about. Now, what is your problem with your kids? Uh, so it could be something else that I have not listed. Again, these are very general. Now, again, I'm going to go back to what I said before. What do you know? And I'm going to show you a couple of pictures and photos, and let me see what you know and who you know. Okay, what is this? This is terrible to do this over a uh, screen. What is this? Uh, is there anybody who knows what this is? Just unmute yourselves and tell me what it is. Airpods. Yes, AirPods. All right. Okay. One point for Raina. Okay. What is this? Fortnite. Bluetooth. Okay. All right. Yes. Okay. We got participants. It says donkey for Fortnite. Okay. Who are these people? Anybody know? No idea. No idea. This is. Yeah, singers. They are singers. singers. Okay, all right. Yeah, this is uh, this is Drake and Travis Scott. All right, Drake is on the left with the purple background. Travis Scott is on the right with the red background. Drake and Travis Scott. All right, remember those names: Drake, Travis Scott. Who's this? Gotta know who this is. LeBron James. All right, LeBron James. Thank you, sir. Sir Indra. Okay, what is this? Who makes this? Chanel. Chanel, all right. Chanel, thank you, all right. Does anybody know what game this is? Among Us. Among Us, <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay, good, good, all right. Uh, can anybody tell me what kind of nails are on the left and what kind of nails are on the right? French manicure on the right. <laughs> and gel nails, acrylic nails. <laughs> yeah, okay, very good. That was my toughest one, you know? <laughs> These are little things that you gotta know. So what did I show you just now, all right? Technology, all right? Video games, online games, music, sports, fashion, cosmetics, body care. Of course, there's uh, the aspect of social media in there. Now, this is the thing that your kids are interested in, all right? No matter what, okay? We're not talking about school. This is not a school academic conversation. We're talking about what your kids find interesting or know about. All right, they know about music. Now, I, 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 they may not know about, you know, the latest song from Drake and Travis Scott, but, you know, I'm sure they know music. Uh, you know, they know about sports. They know about, you know, things in fashion. Uh, and again, uh, this, I, I showed a variety of different things there to illustrate the point of, uh, you know, the different age groups represented from, by, you know, from a 13 year old up to a 19 year old. And, you know, again, these, specific ages are going to be concerned with different things so you know it's good that you know at least i got an answer from everybody on, on most of those things so you know you're pretty you're pretty as a group you're pretty well in touch with uh you know a lot of pop culture and things going on uh so you know again that's very important now a lot of those things are things that um you know uh so i try to make it i try to you know make a cross section of things that your kids know and things that you would know uh so again this leads me into what do you know? So right now I want you to take a moment. I'm gonna give you a minute, all right? Five things, you write down five things that you know your child likes or likes to do, all right? Five things that you know your child likes or likes to do. So you're gonna be writing down five things about your child and then you're gonna be writing about five things about you. All right, five things you like or like to do. All right, go. One minute.
having a tough time. It's not easy. Uh, you know, sometimes we think we know our children. Sometimes we know our children very well. Uh, it, it, it's always it's always very difficult when you're put on the spot like this and say, okay, tell me about your child. What what does your child like? Now I have my own list that I've uh, come up with. So what you what you should have in front of you is something that's very uh, very similar to this. You, you know, I, I'm a visual guy and I like to have uh, charts and graphs. I'm not very good with a lot of data streaming and, and, and different cells in Microsoft, uh, you know, spreadsheets. So I would have, I would have it set up like this. So I have my child. So what is my child like? My child likes sports, eating, sleeping, video games, and uh, not talking to me uh, as I did. No, I was thinking about myself when I was a teenager. Uh, so that's what I liked when I was a teenager. Um, but, you know, you're thinking about your child right now. Again, I don't have a teenager. So, uh, you know, I only can generalize at the moment. Uh, and for myself, uh, I just wrote some things that I like. All right. Uh, Manchester City. I like Manchester City. I like shoes. I like Jordan, Michael Jordan shoes. I like Dragon Ball. Uh, and and uh, I like watches and I like music. Now, of course, I can keep making a longer list. But you know the whole the whole idea here is first is to find out where is the overlap. Now there's a lot of overlap on different things. Uh, you know I, I'm sure I could also add sleeping to my list. Uh, a lot of teenagers enjoy sleeping. A lot of teenagers enjoy staying in their room, uh, and and things like like that. You know, but you know generally the top things that come to your mind is there any overlap between the things you like and the thing your child likes. So uh, you know obviously there is a uh, you know, if my child likes sports and I like Manchester City, that may be a good starting point. Uh, of course, uh, eating, we all have to eat. Uh, but, you know, there are different ways, uh, different approaches we can take when it comes to food, um, sleeping. We all have to sleep. We all will sleep. So, you know, finding things that your teenager is interested in uh, can be difficult because they change. And you know what? Especially with teenagers. They are very complex. I have, a, I have a period, a pyramid of complexity that I call it, all right? I don't have it here in my slides. A period of complexity. And, you know, as a man, as a, as a male in this world, it, yeah, as you rise up to the top of the pyramid, it's always going to be teenage girls. Teenage girls are the most difficult. You know, for me as a man, again, you would have, you know, different lists. You, have, you would have wife, pregnant wife. Uh, and, and as they go up, but teenage girls is going to be one of the toughest ones to deal with. Uh, I think there are different dynamics in a household that make uh, relationships easier or tougher. I think that you will find that if you are a mother, if you are a, wo a woman, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to get along with the eldest son uh, and more conflict between uh, woman and daughter versus dad and daughter. And you know, these, are, these are generalizations, again, not always true, not 100% true, uh, but you, know, you, you will find that you know, some dynamics in the household, different relationships uh, can lead to an easier path and diff different avenues. And again, if you are a, living in a house and both husband and wife are there, then this is also an approach that you have to take as a team. So you have to also look at your own household and see who has the better relationship with my son, with my daughter. And that person has to be the one that takes a step forward to you know, establishing these relationships and opening up more. So I think it's very important that if you are a person who is living with a, your, your spouse, your husband or your wife, uh, it does have to be a team approach. Both have to be on the same page uh, to help because sometimes there are uh, you know, certain times, you know, maybe you are not living together with your husband or wife for whatever reason. Uh, and, you know, you, you are alone. Um, you know, these are things that, you know, are part of the household dynamic, but also have benefits and disadvantages at the same time. Uh, but every household is different. Every family is going to be different. Okay, so now we're going to look. So back to this. So now we have an area. So we have two things now. We have an area of interest, an area of common interest one or two areas, you may have found out that there are zero areas of common interest. Now, if that's the case, don't worry, it's okay, all right? Now, if you have an area of common interest, already that's easy, you, that's a good starting point from where you can start. All right, for example, 
my child likes sports, we can watch sports together. Start that way. We can, my child likes to play futsal. We can go buy shoes together. I can ask him questions or ask her questions. Uh, my child likes K-pop. I don't like K-pop. I don't know anything about K-pop. Uh, if you ask me about K-pop, there's probably two groups or people I could tell you about. I heard about uh, BTS and Blackpink. If you ask me anything more than that, I don't know. But you know what? That brings me on to the next point. Okay, if I don't know, ask a question. But you don't ask the question why. And if you do know, ask a question. Ask a question and pretend you don't know about me. Play dumb. The best thing here is just to start the conversation, but never ask why. Why do you like that? No, you'll, and you'll see this why question coming, coming up again. Why? We don't want to ask why. Why don't we want to ask why? Because why leads to a feeling of self-defense and justification. Somebody asked me, uh, why am I sitting here? Why am I not sitting at my desk where I normally sit? Well, I feel like I have to defend myself. Why? Why do I have to justify this? Why do I have to tell you why I like something, mom and dad? Uh, don't ask why. Ask questions that elicit information without using the word why. Uh, and listen, listen, listen. Let them talk. Right now, this is like, like, again, this is process. You're not going to leave here. Tomorrow, you're not going to fix things. Next month, you're not going to fix things. We're looking at breaking through small chips. Chip away, chip away, chip away, chip away. All right. And that is very important that this is a process. You've gone this many years already. And, you know, again, what is good for today and now is going to be different for later. All right. So it is a step by step process. Play dumb. Ask questions. Don't ask the question why. Don't ask why. Don't use the word why. Okay. Now we're going to come to this section I call reflection time. All right. Who has the problem? Right now you're sitting there in your chair or your couch, your sofa, your bed. Who has the problem? Is the problem with you? Is the problem with your child? Are you sitting there blaming your child? Are you sitting there thinking, well, they have the problem, they have to change. The problem is always going to be with you. You are the parent, they are the child, all right? Now we don't want to judge. We are not here levying judgment but you are the one that has to adapt to your child we're dealing with children kids that are 13 14 up to 19 years old they cannot make decisions uh i think they don't know they don't have much experience in the world you do so who has to change and if you're not willing to accept that then you can't you can't be here you're not going to learn anything from this you have to change you have to start doing different things new things think about just think about other relationships you have had in your life, all right? Other relationships you have had in your life. For the, your spouse right now, when you were dating, I'll ask you right now, when you were dating your husband, your wife, are you the same person you are now as compared to when you were dating? I doubt it. We have to make sacrifices. We've had to make compromises. Uh, we had to learn how to communicate more. I personally am a person that when I get angry, I like to leave. I like to leave. I don't like to talk. I just want to be alone. But my spouse, my wife said, you can't do that, Michael. You can't just leave me. You, if you're mad, you can't just leave the house. I, again, this is something that I had to learn and I had to change about myself. I am the one who has to change. And in this case, you are the one that has to change. And you have to take that on board. And if you're not willing to accept that, then there's never going to be any middle ground. There's never going to be any compromise. Uh, so you are the adult. You got to be willing to change. You have to be willing to not be the judgmental one, the parent who knows it all. Yes, you know it all. And if you've been doing a good job up to this point, you will find that the trust that you put into your children, okay, the trust that you put into them to make their own decisions, the decision, the, the judgment, the advice you wanted to give at the beginning, when if they had a question, if they had a problem, would be the same advice that they come back around to. They've grown up in your house. They know how you think. They know what you're going to say. But don't put it out there in black or white. 
But remember, you are the one that has to make the concession. You are the one that has to concede and understand that you have to change. All right. Only then can we move forward and get closer with your children. So I got a, I got a, an idea. Let's start over. Okay. Let's think about what your teenager, what your child is worried about. Now, if you don't, if you're in this room right now, you're listening to me right now, you don't have a teenager that's not going to apply to you. But if you have a kid between the age of 13 and 19, this will apply. I promise you that. I promise you that. That these things are what they are worried about. They're worried about their face. They're worried about their body. All right. Are they too fat? Are they too skinny? All right. Girls, if you have a daughter who's going through puberty, you better believe they are super worried. All right. They're worried about certain parts of their body. All right. Have you had those conversations with them already? For those of you who have children who are entering teens, pre-teens, these are questions that are going to come up. I guarantee you 100%. Now, these are not things that you need to ask them. Please do not ask them. All right. You will get an automatic wall. But I can tell you, if you don't already know, that these are things that they are worried about. They're worried about how they look. They're worried about pimples. They're worried about their body. Are they too fat? Are they too skinny? The changes that their body is going through. Hair is growing in place. All right? They are worried. This is something that they are worried about. But please don't ask them about it. That will be embarrassing for them. Relationships. I mentioned the social relationship of uh, them and their friends. Now, of course, they're also worried about their personal relationships with boyfriends, girlfriends. Now, maybe they don't have a boyfriend or a girlfriend right now, but I, I'm, I'm sure that they have a guy or a girl that they like. All right. We're not talking about, oh, you allow them to date or you allow them to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. We're not talking about that. All right. Let's be clear. I'm not here telling you that, that you need to allow them to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. I'm here telling you that there is a girl or a guy in their class that they know in the school that they like, all right? That's going to be in their head. They won't admit it, some will, but the majority of them will not. And they will think about this stuff. This is a concern, this is a worry. We're only identifying worries. And of course, the last one I have here is school. Now this is something that, of course, all kids are worried about. They wanna do well in school. They have pressure on them from parents, from teachers, uh, from their classmates. So these are all things that they will be worried about. Now, not the first and the second point are things that are, you know, you are also aware of, things that you've had experience with yourself. Now, I'm going to ask you, when you were a teenager, what were you worried about? When you were in high school, what were you worried about? Was it not these same things? Were you worried about paying PLN? No. Were you worried about uh, your, your go pay is not enough? No. The things you were worried about now as an adult is very different. But you know what? I can promise you that these three things that I've mentioned here were probably on your list as well. Now, you, maybe you don't want to admit it. You say, I was perfectly fine in high school. I didn't need friends. I was perfectly fine. I was comfortable with my body. But you are not your kid. And you are definitely not your kid in 2020. All right? So these are the things they are worried about. Now, how did you handle your concerns? What did you do? Now, there's only so much we can do when it comes to things like acne and pimples. Uh, the thing is that acne and pimples are not biased. All right? They're not biased against certain cultures or races or, or genders. Males, females, all across the world are, are going to have acne and get pimples. Uh, some people are blessed and have very good genes and don't have to wash their face, and they will never get one pimple in their life. They will never be stuck in front of them deciding, oh, do, do, do I squeeze this and pop it or not? You know, that is one of, very, a very tough decision for your children. Now, you're very lucky uh, that, you know, we didn't have, we are very lucky that we didn't have this kind of social media uh, when we were in high school, but you know, kids today, that, that small decision to pop a pimple or not is there. Because what happens when you pop a pimple? It's on your face and it's red and you're bleeding and it's not always great. So, you know, think about how you could help in these areas, okay? Now, again, don't go and ask your kids 
what's wrong, what they think is wrong with their body. Be aware of these things, okay? Be aware. Now, how do you help? How do you help without asking? You have a teenager. You know they are going to be worried about things like, again, their face. Now you have a couple of options. One thing that I can suggest, go to the, go shopping with them, buy them facial products. Now that can work. That may not work. That might be completely embarrassing for some of the kids. In that case, just go and buy it yourself and bring it home and leave it in their room. Don't say anything. Please don't say anything. Don't say anything. Just buy it, leave it. Leave it for them. Put it in their toilet. They have a different toilet. You don't share a toilet. Leave it there for them in their toilet. If, if you share a toilet, put it on their bed. Put it on their desk in their room. Just leave it there. Don't engage in conversation about this. Stuff. Wait for them to talk. Wait for them to talk. Wait for them to come to you. They will ask you, why did you buy this, you know, uh, Garnier L'Oreal face wash for me? I'm not telling you to go to the, I'm not telling you to go to Sogo and buy SK2 for your teenage daughter. That's expensive. There's no need for that right now. Just go buy some face wash if, if, if this is the case, all right? But this is a way to start. They'll come back and you say, well, what's this for? And you can talk, all right? Then it starts, all right? Simple things. And if you have males, children, you have boys, all right? It's just the same. If you're a mother here who has a teenage boy, it's the same. They're thinking the same way, all right? The, uh, acne does not discriminate, all right? Acne has no biases. It will attack all, all right? Big, small, short, skinny, fat, dark, white, all right? All, all right? So please, that is a good, good starting point. Facial soaps, who knew, okay? I got a few rules. Now, again, I'm going to go back to this never ask why. Why? Why, why do you like... Sophia, you know, why are you always, don't ask why, please. Asking why will lead them to, you know, cocoon. And they're not going to talk because, again, they feel like they have to justify. All right? Don't ask why. Ask questions in another way. And I, I think a good way to start is, you know, let them talk. And when they talk, you have what we call the opportunity to use reflective feeling. Oh, that you, you look upset about that. Oh, that makes you happy? Saying things like that. You know, very small prompts that lead them to speak more. But asking questions like why is never good. Not yet. All right? If you have a, a closer relationship with your son or daughter, then it's different. Uh, but, you know, breaking through the ice, getting them to open up more is something that is, is always tough and it's tough to start. And it's, it's just like picking up a new hobby or, 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 you know, doing something new. It's always tough to start to take that risk. And again, you're going to feel awkward. If you're a parent who does not often speak to your child or your child does not often speak to you and you have these feelings of desperation, you've tried everything, all right? You tried everything and it's just not working. Now you have to understand, you gotta take it in breadcrumbs, little by little, all right? Then it will come, okay? I can tell you because I don't know about you guys, but when I was a teenager, I did not have a, the best relationship with my mom. And my mom was the one who was constantly trying and trying. She was constantly asking me questions, constantly interrogating and asking me, and she was only trying. And not looking back, I see how much she was trying. Uh, but I, I feel really guilty and I feel really bad now. And I, I share this with her now. But it wasn't until later on in life after. And again, this is a long-term thing. So don't expect it to be uh, how, how it is now when they're 13 uh, and 14 will be different when they're 15 and 16. You now things can change. All right. But it's important to start to have that relationship and build on that. And I, I, I didn't get around to, uh, you know, really opening up. And to my parents until later on, uh, when after, after I was a teenager. And that is very normal, uh, you know, because uh, teenagers can be quite defensive. And, you know, prying 
and asking too many questions is something that you have to be self-aware about. I can't be in your kitchen and, and lead you through the conversation. You have enough experience to know when your child is getting upset or stops answering and stops talking. Uh, and there are leading questions that you can ask, but never ask why. Because again, why will lead to this defensive position where they feel they have to justify, all right? And I think the bottom point there, if you are talking, how can they? Don't give advice. You only give advice, come in here. You only give advice if they ask, all right? If you are talking, how can they? They can't talk if you're talking. If they ask you something, you answer with one word. Let them talk. Let them talk. You ask questions. You give prompts. You don't talk too much. You just want them to talk. If you're a parent, again, who struggles with this idea of communication with my child, you want them to talk. That's the whole point. Later, again, this is not a one-night solution. All right, this is a long-term solution. So you ask questions that inhibit curiosity. Show your curiosity, not your judgment. You're still a parent, okay? You're, you, you, we're not here to be friends with the kids. You want to be a mentor, you want to guide, but you can't do that if they're not talking to you, if they're not opening up, all right? So, you know, when, when they start talking, you ask questions like, is it like this? You know, is, is it like that? And then they, they, this will help because then if you're right, you know, it, when, when you're asking a question, is it, is it like this? And they're trying to explain something. If you're right, it's okay. But if you're wrong, if it's not like that, then that's their opportunity. They'll, they'll, they'll correct you. No, it's not like that. It's like this, mom. And then they will continue. Now, again, don't give advice unless they ask for your advice. Because once your advice comes out, they shut down. Because then it's mom and dad, again, who are coming out with the rules. Well, it's going to go back to mom and dad, come back with the rules. Do this this way, just this way. You do it like this because of this. Not yet. All right? If you want them to open up, they're not going to open up. They need, you need to be a sounding board. You need to sit there and just listen. All right? Now, we're just talking about day-to-day -day things that will help get more out of them. And don't give advice unless they ask. And again, be patient. This is like weight loss. If you ever tried to lose weight, it doesn't happen like that. All right? Slowly, slowly. All right? And, and it's very important that we understand that. All right? This is a process. It doesn't happen overnight. Your trust has to be gained. They have to understand they can go to mom and dad and mom and dad will listen. Mom and dad will be, I will be able to talk about these things with mom and dad. Uh, and that comes over time. It is a process. This is not a one night solution. This is not a one week solution. Validate their feelings. Okay. Agree with them. I understand why you feel that way, son. All right. I can understand why you feel like that. And stop it there. And if you can touch them, if they're at that age where they let you touch them, where you let them, where they like to sit beside you and you can put your arm around them, or you can go up to them and hug them, not all kids are going to enjoy that. But if you have the kind of relationship that is, where there's, there's touching, there's hugging, there's cuddling, do that. All right. If there's not, don't force it. Please don't force a hug. Don't force a cuddle. Okay. Uh, but if you do have, uh, if you are lucky enough to have it, you know, you're very lucky because, you know, for those of you that have teenagers that don't want to be kissed and hugged and touched, uh, you know, you, you really miss those times when they were younger, when they would run to you and just want to cuddle you with you and sleep with you. Uh, and now it's very different. So if you're lucky enough to have that, please, please do do that. Again, I, I, I'm, not all kids are the same. And I think it's important that you know that. So if you have more than one teenager or more than one child, the approach is going to be different. And it's on you. Again, they don't have to change. Okay? You have to change. All right? Yes, you're the adult. Yes, you're the boss. Yes, it's your house. They live under your house. It's your roof. Yes. But we're talking about a relationship with a kid. 
right? You have to understand that this is the way it's going to work. All right? And this is the only way it's going to work. Have conversations with them. Not interrogations. Conversations. Talk. If you ever wanted to talk to somebody and just talk, not give your advice. Again, we're not trying to find out what they did wrong. We're not trying to levy judgment. We're not trying to give advice. We just want to talk. Uh, and, and sometimes that's hard to do, just talk, uh, because you have to remove your parenting hat. And you, they're not always coming to you for advice. Sometimes they just want somebody to talk to that they can trust, somebody that they can trust who's not going to judge them. And you know, you, there's ways to do that. And I have some like prompts or questions. Uh, you know, when they start saying something, you just say, "Oh, oh, really? Uh, no way, really? Is that crazy, right?" You know, things that will prompt them to continue talking. And talking is the only way that you know that it will get to open up more. And again, be patient with this process. Um, you know, I have a lot of counseling sessions. If you are a parent who has kids in this school, who in your kids are in secondary four, JC1 or JC2, I have spoken to your kids and I know what it's like. And I know the things that they share with me. Uh, so I know that they just want to talk and, you know, they're looking for people to talk to, but the most of the time they are not going to run to mom and dad to talk, but because they're worried that mom and dad are going to be judgmental of them. But you can't help them if they're not talking to you and you don't know what's going on. So if you are worried like, oh, I can't help my child because they won't talk to me. Well, there's a reason they won't talk to you because they've seen you for the past how many years constantly giving advice, constantly giving judgment. And this is the time where uh, you have to cultivate that relationship of trust and understanding between your children and yourself. So uh, again, this is a process and it is tough. It's very difficult to compromise, to make these concessions. Uh, you will feel very awkward. You will find yourself standing there saying, why am I not telling them what to do or what they should do? Don't do that until they ask for your advice and then you will see things start to change, all right? Um, so again, I'm gonna come back to what is your problem? Is it communication? You have conflict. And is there different ways that you can look at addressing these things? Physical issues, do you know how to help? Um, you know, your child, are they overweight or underweight? Uh, how do you help them with that? Do you know how to help them with that? Exercise, proper eating. Uh, body issues are going to be a thing. Uh, if I ask, if I ask children, teenagers to write this down, all right? None of them will write down they're worried about their body. You can go and ask them, they'll be not, they will not say they're worried about their body, but they're worried, right? So you have to be the one who identifies these things and how can I help without, without them knowing I'm helping them, all right? Um, you know, it could be a simple thing from stop buying Oreos, all right? Uh, buying and, and making green tea for them in the morning and telling them to drink the green tea and they don't know you're helping, like things like that, all right? These just ideas we're throwing out there. Uh, so again, every kid's gonna be different and you know, every kid's gonna have different issues, but I can guarantee you going back to that slide that they are going to be worried, but they're not going to talk about what their three main worries are, which is, you know, their face and, and body care, you know, their relationships, their social relationships and school. And you know, probably of all, of all those things, they're only gonna mention school. And that's quite normal. And you know, you can see that, that they're, they're all excited. Uh, and very few of them are able to say that, yeah, I, I like this girl, I don't know how to tell her. Or me and my friends are fighting and we don't know how to, how to solve this problem. We've been friends for so many years and now, now things are changing as we're getting older. Because that, that, will, that will happen. Uh, so you know, like I said, everything is gonna be different. Now, that's, that's pretty much, what all that I can say without getting into specifics, without repeating and repeating the same thing over and over. So now I wanna just take some time to give you an idea, sorry, uh, for some questions so we can get to some uh, specifically, because I think that we are uh, at that point where uh, you're falling asleep. Uh, so, you know, I want to give you an opportunity to ask some questions. Um, 
me see if there's anything that's come to me. Okay. So is there anybody who uh, would like to ask some questions specifically about your children um, or about something that I can help you with, some ideas, some advice, anything? Again, I don't have all the answers. If I had all the answers, I'd be a billionaire. All right. Uh, I, you know, I, I can give a lot of advice on kids and, uh, you know, what to expect and, you know, different approaches that you can take. But it always starts with communication or boil down to communication and, and think, OK, here's a good question. What should we do? How should we re what should we react when we find out that they lied to us? Very good. Uh, and like, you know, lying is going to come back to that whole judgment thing. But I think it's you, you can ask them, hey, what? Why did you, if you ask them why did you lie? Versus finding out finding out what they were trying to hide. Um, so they will lie. They're teenagers, and you know, reacting without being angry. Now I'm going to assume that they are lying about something that is not harmful to their body or harmful. I, I'm going to assume it's something that you know because there's different kinds of lies. Uh, you know, if we're talking about, you know, that they were drinking alcohol and they lied, uh, that one you are very well allowed to react in an angry way. If they lied about something else that is not, you know, harmful to their physical body, uh, you know, or something that can get them in serious trouble, then, you know, the, the way that I would suggest to reacting is, you know, calmly talking about it in a non-confrontational way. Uh, you know, sometimes when uh, we have uh, issues with our parents, you know, you may, as parents, you may sit them in a certain place. You may call them down from their room, sit, tell them sit at the kitchen table, you want to talk. Uh, you may enter their room and tell them, and then, you know, stand there. Body language is important. How are you standing? Are you standing, uh, are you standing like this? You're standing with your hands on your hips. Uh, if you're in a, in a, you'll find how big of a difference communicating is when you are lying down. Lying down on your sofa and you call them over, ask them to bring you a, uh, a drink, ask them to, you know, go to the, go to the fridge, get me some water, please. And they bring the water over, you're lying down and then you talk. And then you can ask them, did, did this happen? And you'll find out how different things can go from the way you were standing, the way you were sitting. Lie down. Uh, if, if any of you, I can't see most of you, but if any of you are sitting on a sofa, Right now, do you have a pillow in front of you and you're sitting like this, we're holding a pillow in front of you. This is a comfort position. We sit down, uh, we grab a pillow and we sit with a pillow covering, or covering our stomachs. You know, uh, this uh, is very different from how you can approach and talk to a child when you're confronting them about doing something wrong. Lie down. Okay, they don't feel that threatened. Uh, they will be more likely to open up. And how should you react? Um, now, again, depending on what they lied about, I, I, would, I would approach it in a conversational way. Uh, you know, and again, this is a time where you may have to use your own judgment in terms of what the lie was, was about. But I would first start by, I'm, I'm going to be quite honest, I'm sure that this will not be the first time that you were angry at your children. So if you have a certain position in the house uh, that you use uh, or a way that you approach your child and the way you stand, don't use that uh, if you want things to open up and you want more information. Uh, don't get angry, uh, you know, unless it's something worth getting angry about. Uh, you know, if it's, if it's a small lie, you want to find out, you want to find out why they lied. More importantly, why did they feel they had to hide this from you? And the best way to show that is going to require some acting on your part. What I mean by that is that if you want them to open up more, show that you're sad, show that you're disappointed. Don't show that you're angry. The feeling I get, you know, when as a kid, as a child, they really don't want to disappoint their moms and dads. That's why they're so proud when they come home with a test mark or a report card scar, a report card score, and it's really high. They want to show you. So think about the opposite. They don't want to disappoint you. They don't want to let you down. So uh, in the case of that you caught them in a lie, you show them that you're sad. You show them that you're disappointed, but you don't show them that you're angry because they're expecting angry. And this expectation of anger will revert them back to the same thing 
where they also shut themselves down and they don't want to talk. But if they see sad and they see disappointment, they see a relaxed position of lying down, you cuddling a pillow, you cuddling a, a stuffed animal, uh, you know, uh, um, that is going to make a difference in the way that they respond. So I would say body language, setting, and the emotion that you show in your voice, you know, without raising your voice, talking calmly, how you would speak if you were sad, disappointed to them, that will definitely be a plus and get them to speak more. Hopefully that was helpful, Miss Lilianti. You know, again, and you know what, parents, you have a school behind you, okay? You can try everything, you can try everything, and it's not gonna work. If it doesn't work, contact your child's teacher. Contact me. I'm happy to help. You will be so surprised how many, how many kids are able to open up to their teachers and have good relationship with their teachers. And you can find out information from us as well as a school. Sorry, I'm just reading the question. Following the previous question, what if they lie about schoolwork? Should we not give advice? Or how can we give advice or respond to make them hear? Thank you. Okay, very good question. So if they lie about schoolwork, which is something that is uh, quite common, uh, you know, I think that you know, you, what you have to do is, again, uh, this is the time not to give advice. And it's good because this is common sense, right? I, I don't, your, your child doesn't need to hear you repeat about uh, why they need to do schoolwork. It's, it's common sense. You, you do, if you don't do schoolwork, you don't get the grade, you get a failing mark. Uh, I think that you need to take a different approach as to say, how can you help? What do you need to do to you know, make sure they do it next time? And this is, this is there's a middle ground here because you don't want to let them off the hook uh, because this is something that you should be worried about as a parent if they're not doing the work. Why did it, didn't they do the work? Uh, are they making excuses? And these are things that you need to find out. And, um, you know, but without, again, you have to know when it comes to doing schoolwork, it's a given that if a teacher assigns work, the kid should do the work and the kids already know if it's wrong if they don't do the work. So they already know they're in the wrong. So at this point, they know that you know uh, about it and you're probably going to react in a certain way. So it's more of a approach of how can I help you so this doesn't happen again? Um, and it's not, uh, it, it, again, it may require a little bit of, uh, you know, fibbing or lying on your part, some underhandedness. What I mean by that is, um, Ms. Dea, did you get a call from Mr. Michael saying that your son or daughter did not do the work? And then you, you're, you're sad, you're disappointed because, you know, Mr. Michael called you at your office. Mr. Michael called you or, or whatever teacher, uh, you know, uh, and these are, these are things, again, the, the sad and the disappointment will lead to them not doing this again. But they already understand it's wrong. So it's, it's important that we don't continue to say that it's wrong. Uh, they know it's wrong. And we just have to find ways to calmly approach at, at the start. And then also you can come up with ways, have a calendar uh, where you, you can, now this is going to be more work, but you know, have a calendar set up. Okay, so this week, what are the assignments we have to do? Let's put it together, let's work together. So we, we together, we, we, we make sure that you meet all the deadlines. We make sure all the work is done. Um, and you know, it's, it's important that you work together, but don't come off as angry because they already know it's wrong. Uh, they need somebody who's going to help them. Uh, and somebody who's going to support them and, and come up with creative solutions because you'll find that after you do that a couple of times, they don't need that anymore and they won't be missing homework anymore because that's already ingrained in them. But it is, it is, it's teamwork. And it's working together without being angry. It's working together, uh, holding hands and, uh, and, and, and side by side rather than you need to do your homework next time. Don't disappoint me. Don't embarrass me. Don't make me like, no, that's, that's not going to work because they, they already know that. And they need to see the different side of you that shows uh, cooperation and uh, you know, that you want to help them uh, without getting angry, without raising your voice. And uh, it, it's working together as a team. If there's a problem, can we both 
parents approach the kid at the same time? Yeah, it depends on what the problem is, uh, Lilianti. Uh, you know, if it's a problem, uh, you know, I, I would say like, you know, there's so many X factors that are involved. Did your child steal your car and drive around North Jakarta and pick up his friend? Yes, both parents approach. Uh, you know, if there is a problem between your child and their boyfriend and girlfriend, uh, that one would be a one parent approach. Now, how serious is the problem? Um, and I would always recommend not both parents approaching unless it's something very serious. Um, if it's something regarding schoolwork or, or, or you caught them, uh, I'm gonna refer to back to what they were, you were talking about, about lying about something. If what they lied about is not uh, uh, going to put them in jail or if it's not gonna hurt them physically, then I wouldn't, uh, recommend both parents take the approach. I would definitely, um, you know, take a step back and see which parent, mom or dad, has a better relationship with this kid, uh, and have that one be the one who approaches the kid. A two-parent approach is always very intimidating. Uh, you know, you can imagine. Imagine I called you to the principal's office and you saw me sitting beside the DHT, uh, Mr. Richard Cross, me, Mr. Richard and Mr. Alfie were all sitting in the same room and you walk in, you can imagine how intimidating that is and how scary that is, unless it was something very serious. So again, I'm going to err on the side of caution and say like, oh, unless it was something, if it was something that's gonna land them in jail or something that's gonna hurt them physically, uh, you know, whether it be their health or they put somebody else in danger, then those are the times where I take a two parent approach. Um, you know, if it's something regarding like not doing an assignment or lying about going somewhere, uh, I, it would still be a one parent approach because that is something where you can develop that relationship. And again, it depends on the kinds of relationships that you already have presently. Um, but a two parent approach can be quite intimidating. I know when, like, I, I'm going to tell you, you probably have in your house, you probably have one parent, depending on the kid, one parent who is the one who is always nagging, always yelling, saying, okay, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do this. And then that parent is the one who's always loud, always making problems for the rest of the house and the kids. But then you have the other parent and you know if that parent gets involved, you know it's serious. In my house, when I was growing up, it was my dad. My mom was the one, I come from a house of three boys, okay? So all together, there's four boys in the house, three boys plus my dad. And in the house, mom was the one who was always angry, always yelling, always saying, go wash the dishes, go cut the grass. And then you knew that it was serious when dad got involved, right? So if both of you are involved, you know it's something serious. So I would only suggest that a two-parent approach be taken if it falls into one of those categories. But again, you know, use your discretion. You know, you're an adult, you run the house. Uh, but again, those are, that's my suggestion. <laughs> it's a good question. Is it legit for parents to read their child's WhatsApp? Now, this is a tough one because social media, it can be so sticky. And uh, it is, we do have the, uh, yeah, you know what, like it, it depends. Because once you get caught doing that, there's no trust again. And, you know, as much as you want to know about what your child is doing, um, if it's very tough, I, I would say that if you are, if you are, if you have a child who is 13, 14 years old, um, and they don't know, then that would be a time where I would, I'm not going to say it's okay. Because again, once you get caught, they're never going to trust you again, you're invading their privacy. Um, but I know you're worried, but you got to trust them. Who has been raising them? for the past 13, 14 years, you. So are you telling me you have no faith in yourself? I'm sure you do. Now, you can't say that you're a bad parent and nobody here is saying that, but just through your own actions every day, all right, your kids see these things and you gotta trust them to make the right judgment calls and, and, and make the right decisions. Now. Making mistakes on social media, I think it's important that you educate them as to what they say in social media and things that they should say and they shouldn't say. 
things that they should post and repost because we make it clear as a school, you know, especially to a lot of our older students that what they post on social media can come back to get them. And, you know, I, I give them the example as a person who just, you know, as a person who hires teachers and staff, as a person who admits children into the school, I tell all the kids the same thing. And you can use these stories, okay? Because university counselors do the same thing. Other schools do the same thing. The first thing that I do when a teacher or a, a student's name comes across my desk is I Google them. I Google them, all their social media comes up. I can find out about them. So if I see that they've posted some racist stuff, I don't want that person in my school. And this can come back to your children the same way. And you know, WhatsApp conversations are easy to get. I just need a phone number, all right? I'm not a hacker, but I can, it's very easy to find out how to find out information about somebody's WhatsApp conversation. Um, so I think that my, the best advice I could give you without you losing their trust is to just let them know that you know future schools, current schools, uh, universities, employers, it's very easy to find out about the things that they speak about on WhatsApp uh, and speak about on social media. It's not, you know, you see it all the time with celebrities now. People go back 12 years before, 10 years before they were famous and they find all these racist things that they have said when they, before they were famous and then they get in trouble for it. And I think it's important that we educate our kids when it comes to social media and the social footprint that they leave. Um, so, you know, you got to trust them to do the right thing and make the right call. But I think it's important that you also tell them that, you know, um, they can get caught out for these kinds of things and make them aware. Um, if your child is between the age, if your child is over the age of 15, I wouldn't recommend it. I wouldn't recommend reading their WhatsApps, um, you know, I'll give you the example of your, your spouse, all right, your husband or your wife. Uh, do you read their WhatsApps? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, they, they have that privacy. You may have a relationship uh, that is uh, where, where you have all the passcodes. Um, sometimes some people, you know, there's, they think, oh, there's no need for me to read the WhatsApps. Um, you got to think about it almost in the same way. How would your spouse, if they don't do this, right? Uh, how would your spouse feel if you just went to their phone and you started reading through all their conversations? Because things can, can be taken out of context. Now, I'm not saying that your child who is 13 or 14 years old is having uh, intense conversations through WhatsApp, um, but there is this idea that, uh, you know, if you're reading them those conversations now, you're going to run into this, this, this future of, you know, never really trusting your child to make these judgment calls. And I think it's important that you do you know, educate them and enlighten them about the social media world. And also, you know, because the only thing that you're going to really gain from reading WhatsApp conversations of your child is more stress and more worry. All right. Um, I, and I, I've seen that and, and I think that it's best if you don't, I'm going to leave it up to you. Those are my personal opinions and what I've seen in the past. Um, and I think, that, you know, you got to trust yourself also. You got to trust that what you've been doing uh, for the past uh, few years uh, since they were born, the way that you've raised them, the morals and the ethics that you've raised them in your house. And you also got to do your part to, you know, you know enlighten them and educate them about, uh, you know, what's appropriate. And, uh, you know, and again, children seeing their parents sad children, teenagers, seeing their parents disappointed is far more powerful than children seeing their parents angry. And um, I think that that is something that you have to convey on to them. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't recommend it. It's a slippery slope. Uh, and, you know, after you get into the WhatsApp conversations, things get, get deeper and deeper. If your child is not a teenager and your child is still young, uh, and they have a cell phone for some reason, and they have WhatsApp for some reason, I'm not judging you, but you know, if they're too young, uh, then yeah, read their WhatsApps, you know, because they can, they can still be, they're still susceptible. But you know, conversations between them and their friends, um, I wouldn't recommend it uh, personally, but you know, again, I leave, it, I leave it to you. Those are just my thoughts and opinions. Because you know, trust is hard to gain.
and you know it's 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 even harder to get back. Mr. Michael, yes, I'd like to ask Mr. Michael. Actually, my son, um, you know, he's into music, which number one I don't understand. It's like he's really into rap. Okay. The problem I have with it is that it contains a lot of cuss words. Yes. Right. And um, you know, I mean, I I I don't want to be judgmental about it, but I feel like you're listening to this like all the time in the bathroom in the when you're working isn't it getting into your your subconscious right yeah no that's very very good question yeah and you know what i think that that is uh, something that uh like a, a lot of the kids uh you know today they they like rap music they like hip hop uh you know they like rock music and a lot of the lyrics in this these songs are about having sex selling drugs you know, shooting people, um, and and you know there is a worry that this will be uh, the case that oh I don't want my kid trying drugs, um, and, and I don't want them swearing. Um, I think it's important that they know that the meanings of those words. Um, but uh, you know, as as a person who's seen lots of kids also uh, grow up listening to those kinds of stuff, I, I would just make sure as a parent that you know you double confirm that you know hey so what do you think about that son uh you know uh don't ask them to justify why they like rap music um but you know you can ask them so like what do you think about what this guy's saying uh you know or you can ask them so what does this lyric mean and then get them to lay it out for you and you know they know it's wrong they're not going to be uh, a person who goes and buys a gun and starts robbing banks, like in some of the songs. I know it is very uh, scary as a parent to hear your child, your baby, listening to a song where uh, the guy is talking about uh, having sexual intercourse with you know, a lot of other girls and uh, them glorifying that. But that is the state of the culture of uh, you know, pop culture. And you know, we have to accept that because the, the more we say no to that, the more they want it. You know, it's the same thing like, you know, if you tell your kid, don't date, don't date this person, they will date that person more or want to date that person more. And the same thing goes with music. You have to, you, you, you have to take a step back and ask them to talk about it. Uh, you know, so say, so what does that mean? What does it mean when he says that? And, you know, again, pretend to be, pretend to be done, pretend to play dumb and, you know, get them to explain. That's how they get them talking. And then, uh, you know, they know it's wrong. They are not, they are not kids who have, uh, psychological issues, uh, you know, uh, the, these are kids that, you know, are listening to this music and most of them are just listening to it because that's what's cool. And most of them are listening to it just because that's what they see on their Instagram uh, search page. When they're looking for things, they see guys that have face tattoos and they think that that's cool and they want to be cool and they want to make sure that their friends, that they have this things to talk about with their friends. I wouldn't worry so much, but I think it's important that as parents, we confirm with them that this is not good stuff. I mean, you can listen to it fine, uh, but you know, without having that feeling of them having to justify why. So we're not asking them why they're listening to this. Uh, we're just asking them if they know what that means and then continue on from there. And then you, you want them to explain and talk because you know, in, in Historically, things like rap music is always going to contain lyrics like that. You will find that they'll be okay, and just, it's just music. It's the same thing with video games. As parents, we're always worried about these violent video games that our kids play. Um, and we don't want them growing up and like, you know, going to school and getting into fights all the time. And I think it's very important that, again, we go back to this whole thing of, you know, kids have been in our house. Kids see the way that we live our lives. And, you know, they also have access to social media and television where they can see the consequences. They're quite aware of the consequences of these kinds of things and doing these kinds of things. Uh, so it's, it, it, that, those consequences still need to be suddenly there, suddenly reconfirmed. Uh, but you know, you can't fight it. You can be disappointed. You can always, now it's important also you express your opinion. All right, now what I mean by that is that shows that you're an individual. You're not a mom, okay? You gotta say, I don't like that kind of music. And then, or you play your music louder, all right? 
because that shows you as a person. And that's important. Your kids see you as a person, right? They don't always need to see you as a mom. They need to see you as, okay, oh, my mom likes music. Have you ever talked to your own children about when you and your husband or you and your wife used to date? It's really strange uh, when you see your kids' faces. So, you know, play your music. Uh, tell, them that you're, tell them that their music is trash, right? Have these conversations. And then you can say, this is an easy way to open up. You tell them, hey, you know, your music is trash. Why are you listening to that? You should be listening to this and play their music. And then the conversation starts, the, the debate starts. You can say, you're, in your music, all they talk about is shooting people and drugs and guns. My music has real meaning. And then, you know, this is where the conversation starts. And this is another good way that it can open up. So that's uh, just my, my idea. Thank you, Mr. Michael. All right. Social media always broadcasts about fake and instant ways, the best thing to do. How can I avoid it? And how can I support them to read something with hard work? Uh, that is a good question. Uh, yeah, you know, you, you just see our social media. You know, you, you, you see if you check, right, on your social media, that, that search page. You know, we are trained as people now in social media that if we are not taking, like I'm gonna use women as an example. If we are not taking a picture, holding our purse in a certain direction, then we're taking the photo wrong. If we're sitting at a table and we're not putting our purse in the photo in front of us while we're all posing and the cameras, we're taking the photo wrong and we have to do it again. Uh, so this instant gratification is there. And I think that we really have to make our kids understand. I've talked to so many kids and so many kids have this dream of becoming a YouTuber or becoming, they think it's so important that they have, you know, 30,000, 40,000 followers. Yeah, dad, I can make so much money if I have so many followers and I do these crazy things. I can get sponsors, I can get endorsements. Yeah, that's like one person out of 10 million that can do that. I think it's important that they know that, that you tell them. And, you know, some kids, you have to break down the data. And you got to show them how many people, how many YouTubers are there in the world? How many people are posting on social media? And social media projects this, this uh, sickness upon us that, you know, you see people posing with their, I'm going to go back to their Chanel purse. I see a girl posing with their Chanel, Chanel boy purse. I want that purse. How do I get that purse? I need to work hard so I can get money to buy that purse. And then I have no money left. Uh, and we, as parents, you know, have to ask ourselves, are we showing our kids that same image just at home? Uh, and, and I think that it's important that our kids know that, yeah, I have a Rolex. I have a Mercedes. I, even if you don't, I have a Toyota, but that did not come from the Toyota tree. That came from my hard work. I have to save this much money. I have to work this many years to pay this off. And, and you know, it's not something that where it, it comes from the values that you instill in them. And I think that, uh, you know, hard work is always going to trump everything. And what I, what I, I hate to use that pun, but it will trump. It, it will come out as the winner. And social media is always going to be there as the thing that, that uh, infects our brains and our minds. And we have to understand that, um, you know, kids are so easily brainwashed by what they see on social media. But that's why they need us to balance it in a positive way. They, you can't lecture them, okay? They see something on social media, you can't be saying, no, that's not right. No, that's not right. No, you can't do that. That's not how, that's not real life. That approach is going to be very, what we call didactic. And that's you being parent uh, rather than you asking questions, you know? So they see somebody on social media. So you think that's real and, uh, you know, getting them to do the research on the people that they admire so much, asking them, maybe they saw, you know, the, a person who has the latest shoes that cost uh, you know, 80 million rupiah for this pair of shoes. Uh, ask them to figure out how long it takes, what kind of job they need to uh, afford clothes like that, gadgets like that, devices like that. So it's, it's very important that you empower your kids to do the research themselves and then find out for themselves. Remember, information that comes from you, 
is always going to be information from mom and dad. You could tell your kids something today. One hour later, I could tell it to them and they'll listen to me. They'll listen because I said it rather than you. Let them find out this stuff for themselves. So it's about you again dropping their bread for them so that they find out. You find out, okay, let's say uh, they, they want to be like a YouTuber, like so-and-so, Mr. Whoever, and then ask them to find out how long did it take this person to get to this stage? How many videos did they have to make? Who did they have to compete with? Uh, where are they living? Where did they move to? And, and uh, you know, it goes back to the same thing with like uh, luxury items that they see. People are not posting, uh, people who are getting tons of likes on social media are not posting uh, photos with their uh, old car from 1980. Uh, they're posting photos in their Lamborghini. And they are thinking that, oh, the kids are seeing that. They're like, oh, this is so cool. I want a Lamborghini. I want an orange, bright orange Lamborghini. Uh, and uh, it's something that I want to get because I see this guy. He's got 200,000 followers, and I want that. That is something that will never go away because social media is only going to get more worse. And it is only going to drag, be a strong stone attached to our kids as they grow older and older. And, uh, and it's up to us to, you know, sort of bring our kids to reality without being uh, that lecturer, without being that person who gives, uh, tells them what's right and what's wrong. It's about telling them to go find out more information. And, you know, you may have to do some research first to find out, okay, so this is the person's name that they like and ask them to go, go figure this out. And then let them see. They, once they find out for themselves, that's when they hit that moment of enlightenment of what we call self-actualization, where they've done the work, they've done the research, and they found out more. Like, oh, well, you know, for example, Logan Paul. Logan Paul is not really that cool, and I don't want to be like him. Uh, and, you know, they'll see the thousands, hundreds of thousands of more people who worked hard and just are regular people and just post on social media for fun and don't use it as a guide for life. Yes, it'd be all. It'd all be very nice if I could go back to my uh, my my uh, my house uh, that, and, and an expensive condominium, you know, that oversees the Jakarta skyline, and go live in my my uh, my go sleep in my Gucci bed. Uh, but that is not uh, realistic, and that is not something that I aspire to. I don't care about those kinds of things, and they have to know that you don't care about those kinds because material materialistic items, luxury items are prevalent throughout on social media. And you see people, they have a lot of brand name shirts, brand name bags, and this often blurs the hard work, the, the pictures that the kids have, because the kids don't see the hard work that had to go in. How many hours did I have to work to buy that diamond ring? How many years did I have to work to buy this car? Just put a down payment on a car. I think it's important that they know the struggle. So it's, it could come back to you to show them the other side of life and show them how hard that these people who are famous now had to work uh, and how many people try and fail and are doing nothing now. Um, so again, it, uh, we always have to look to us. We cannot blame social media. We can only deal with it. Uh, and we can only work to you know, educate our children and show them the way in a way that does not come off as lecturing, all right? Any advice on peer pressure, especially true for material? Yes, yes, peer pressure. Um, you know, uh, as adults, we have peer pressure, all right? In our families, we have peer pressure, all right? Your, your sister, your cousin got this new uh, car, purse, uh, your, your, your brother got this new shirt, uh, this peer pressure everywhere. Um, it will always come back to happiness. And, you know, I, we are all victims of peer pressure. And what I mean by that, it doesn't always necessarily mean going out and acting on it, but we feel that. And we, we feel now, some of us are older now. But when I was younger, I always felt that peer pressure. I, my, my friends got those shoes. I have to get those kinds of shoes. Uh, my friend had that new jacket. I want that jacket. Um, but it didn't always mean that um, it made me happy. And I think that uh, the difference between being accepted and being popular amongst their social group versus are they really happy, uh, it's, that's a tough one. Because dealing with peer pressure is something that only the children themselves can manage. 
we can give them advice on dealing with peer pressure that comes back to self-happiness and what makes you happy and not caring what the rest of the world thinks um, because in the end that is what it's about um, but you know kids there's no way that they can understand it i think that it's important that we make them understand um, what makes them happy you know it goes back to simple things like them sitting down and writing making a list what makes them happy and where do they find being accepted by their friends on that list um, and and peer pressure is something that will never go away and and again it will always come back um, to us as parents and us as parents making sure that they know um, that because they have the newest purse, because they have the newest watch, it's not going to lead to their friends accepting them more. Uh, it's always going to come back to their heart, their personality, uh, their loyalty to their friends, uh, their support of their friends. And, um, you know, peer pressure is something that's not going to go away, and especially luck with luxury items and fashion, it's never going to go away um, unless, you know, we blacklist all of social media throughout the world. So, you know, it's always going to be there, but I think it's important that, you know, we, we constantly repeat that old adage of, you know, money can't buy happiness, money can't buy morals, money can't buy hard work. Um, and, um, you know, the number of very, very many examples we have of people who have lots of money who act inappropriately and people who have lots of brand name uh, shoes, bags, wallets, watches, cars, who act inappropriately. Uh, and again, it's, it's, it's a process of, of the child learning for themselves uh, and uh, it's, it's only can, can be that way. But again, it's important that we come off as people who are dropping the breadcrumbs in front of them. Not a person who's saying, no point to be worried about what kind of purse your friend has. As soon as you start being that way, they want it more, right? So it's about leading them down the path. And you know, it's gonna be different for, for everyone and uh, every kid is gonna be different. Some of you have kids that are very open-minded and understanding and, and more receptive to things you say. Some of you have kids that are very stubborn and hard-headed. Uh, so um, that is, that is uh, different for everybody here. Mr. Michael, how to tell my child, <laughs> this is a good one, how to tell my child to reduce the amount of time from playing games that he really likes. He's really into that. He will do the assignments fast and play the games. Don't tell about the quality of his work. Oh, that is a very good, uh, very good one. Uh, you know, I have uh, had a lot of parents tell me about things like that. Um, you know, a lot of games, you, you have to, you have to look at, what they're playing, uh, how long they're playing. Um, this is a tough one because you know what? They're always, you, as, as parents, we're always going to go back to asking them, well, did you finish your homework? And okay, if you finish your homework, then you can play. And then it leads to the whole idea of, okay, the kids will start finishing their homework and rush through their homework really quickly. And just so they can start playing because they know as soon as they're done, you're going to ask, as soon as to get permission to play, uh, the only requirement is to finish the homework. And, you know, if the, definitely, I can, I, I'm sure the quality of the work is not going to be there. So I think that it's important that you as a parent also play teacher. What I mean by that is you uh, ask them to show you their work. I'm not asking you to grade their work, but remember what the work that they did was and then tell them, let them know, uh, let them know that, you know, if the mark that they get on this assignment from this teacher is not of a certain percentage you know if it's not over 80 percent then they're not going to get to play uh next time uh because you are an adult in this case it's okay to be a little bit uh you know a little bit stern uh because they're taking advantage of you all right because and you know better so in this case you know you may want to be a little bit more stern a little bit more firm but it's important that they have it in front of their face in black and white Mom is going to check how I did in the Bahasa Indonesia assignment. And if I didn't do well because I rushed through it and make it clear to them that you know that doing something halfway, but saying it's done, but without good quality does not count. And, you know, what you have to do is take note of what the assignment was, what the assignment, when they say their homework is done that day, 
you're going to have to make a note. You know, it could be on your notes app, on your phone. Uh, you can put it in a calendar uh, so that it reminds you to check, uh, you know, uh, next, the next day or in a couple of days to check the work. But again, you know, the, the quality of work. And then that way they'll know that mom is or dad is checking my work. And they're going to talk to the teacher and ask them that you don't need to talk to the teacher to have a full, full on, you know, how's my kid doing update. Just message the teacher and ask what score did they get on this assignment? And then go back to the kid. They have to know that you're, we, we, as parents, the worst thing we can do is give empty threats. All right, what I mean by empty threats are things by saying, you know, if you don't do this, then, you, you, then there's, this is the punishment. But if the empty threats are where you don't follow up and you don't actually have the punishment or you don't follow up on your side. Because once you start doing empty threats, there's no respect. They're never gonna be scared, uh, never gonna be worried. So I think that it's important that, you know, you follow up on some, on, on some of this stuff. And I think that, uh, you know, you lay it out there because the you know, quality of the work is something that is, he has to know or she has to know that um, you are aware. You are not a clown. You are not an idiot. You are aware that they are rushing through just so that they can play. So now that I know, son, that you're rushing through just so I can play, I'm going to be talking to Mrs. Ibu or Bapak so-and-so at school tomorrow about your work. Then you'll see a change in their face. And I think that it's important that you not only say that, but you actually do do that. And then that way you'll see the consistency in terms of the quality input. Uh, but again, it's a, it's a, it's a process. So, uh, you know, it, it requires work on your side, on your end. It is going to require some work. Okay, everybody. Uh, I feel like I've been talking for so long and, I, I, and I'm very uh, apologetic if uh, I was not able to answer your questions or cover anything for you that was helpful. Uh, you know, I'm very um, grateful to have had you all here with me uh, today. I'm really happy. Um, you know, I have lots of ideas. I'm very, very excited to talk about these kinds of things. Um, it's always interesting to get different perspectives uh, from people and uh, different ideas and different idea sharing. So I really appreciate you coming and joining me today. Um, you know, as people who are here the first time around, uh, if you would like me to do this again, uh, or, or you have any other topics that you would like me to speak about, please, please let me know. You can let me know. You can let uh, Miss Monica in the marketing department. You can email the school at info at syskg.org. Uh, and we are really happy. You know, we're happy to do this. You know, I like talking. I talk a lot. Uh, and I'm very happy to do this. So, you know, um, dealing with teenagers is something that we don't have all the answers for. So if you ever need anything, you know, please let me know. You want to do more uh, talks like this or talks like this of a similar nature. Uh, please let me know. So I just wanted to extend my thanks and appreciation to all of you today. Uh, really happy to have had this opportunity to speak with you. And if you want more information, more help, more sharing, you know, just please let me know. I'll be happy to do that with you, uh, everybody else, or even on a personal basis with you, your husband, uh, you or your wife uh, in, a, in a closed, closed room. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming out today. Appreciate it. I hope you have a great, uh, you know, a great uh, I guess you still have uh, I guess it'll be dinner time coming up. So uh, please enjoy your dinners and have a great rest of the weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Right. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Michael. Okay. Well, Thank you, Mr. Michael. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Bye. Right. Thank you, Mr. Michael. It was so good today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank right. you, Mr. Very Michael. good sharing. All right, no problem. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Thank you, sir. Yep. Very good sharing. Thank you. Thank you.